Hey everybody, BTO Pro here uh, at elmsln.org. Uh, today I'm going to be showing you the latest and greatest we have. Uh, this is a pre-release of what will be 0.9.0. .0. Uh, we're trying to get it out right before Elms turns 10, celebrating our 10th birthday soon as far as uh, open source contributions. Uh, so we're going to go on a tour of what's there avail uh, available now. Um, as well as, you know, how to make content, how do I make a course, what the heck is a course network look like, um, and uh, check out our brand new studio tool, which is a uh, Polymer uh, application. Uh, so let's dig in. So first thing you need to do to get started is go check out uh, elmsln.org. Uh, it has all the latest info. You can find links off to, you know, different parts of the project, get documentation, figure out how to install a thing, play with it locally. Uh, what we're going to do today is the play with it locally part. So hit get Elms LN, takes you over to our GitHub repo here. Um, you can see we have a lot of contributors on the project, uh, both from Penn State and just a kind of larger Drupal community. Um, and so this is, uh, first of all, it's if you're familiar with Drupal, this doesn't look like Drupal. Uh, that's kind of the point. We use Drupal as kind of an application development and uh, deployment management framework because there's a lot of really good automation uh, packages and things with it. Uh, so what I'm going to be showing you today is I downloaded this or uh, Git cloned, you know, if you're doing developer lingo. Um, and then in terminal, I did, I went into the directory for Elms LN and Elms LN comes with uh, what's called a vagrant file built in. And a vagrant file allows you to spin up a, a test environment basically with just from your local computer. Uh, so it's in, you don't need a server to, to get playing. Uh, it's in the documentation how to do this. If you haven't set up Vagrant before, um, you just kind of click through, download some things, and then we run Vagrant up, and Vagrant will just go, and it'll install a fresh copy of Elm's Learning Network on our computer. So at the end of that, you'll see this whole host updater thing. Um, we get that a lot. There's a lot of domains to Elm's. It's not a single domain application. Uh, if you're if you're comfortable in command line, I could do then vagrant ssh, uh, which is the equivalent of uh, securely connecting to uh, the server, if you will. It's, it's kind of set up this fake you know little server here locally, and I can poke around. We can see uh, cd elms ln, and hey, there's the library running there. So it's it's installed databases. It's put the code in the right place in this you know fake server, uh, configured things and performance optimized them, all that great stuff. So what we're going to be showing you today is uh, currently the 9x branch of the project. Uh, you can see in here branches 0.9.x, and soon it will be the 0.9.0 release of the project. So the first thing you're going to do after you run through the install is you're going to go to online.elmsln.local, and it's going to direct you to a page that currently looks like this. So to log in, and it says this in the console, but it's admin and then admin. I know, super secure when we're running localhost here. So I'm going to hit log in. And the first time you log in, it's going to give you a message like, hey, you should make a course. Um, but if you log in subsequent times, it doesn't say that. So uh, you can see I could go to courses. We can see what I've already made here uh, as far as I have a course called Tests and a course called Sing 100. If I want to add another one, there's this little a fast action button over here and click that. You can see the different things that I can add. Uh, if you've been following the project for a while, you might notice the UX is hopefully uh, seeing some serious improvements over past offerings. Uh, this is because we're fully implementing web components uh, and working towards uh, basically building a one page, very slick application. Uh, so I'm gonna set up a course. It's my first operation here. Let's see, I get a form to set up a course. What are details? Uh, so this is going to be called Demo 100 because institutions always have course names like that for making a demo to people. Uh, we can then at this point select, you know, who this is uh, being displayed to, whether it's, you know, an OER type of a course. Uh, that can be changed later. But um, now we're going to pick the structure of our network. And so the thing you're primarily going to want to grab is the course outline. And now uh, the Open Studio is also very actively developed. Um, it's not to say there isn't anything developed in blogs and discussion and innovate, but they're kind of still out. You know, we're not using them actively at the moment, I should say. Uh, so they're kind of there for future purposes, experimentation. 
Um, the discussions is for discussion forum that we still need to flush out the, the usability of, and the blogs is you know for a course blog, which again needs its usability uh, enhanced. So once I've selected the things I want to build, um, I can also pick a uh, content outline. So this is just to get some, some kind of fodder content in there. Uh, you can do a pretty cool thing as well with upload, um, or you can you know just upload an XML, um, or actually git import is the one I was wanted to point to. Um, so if you use a project called, or another service called Gitbook, uh, which is just for making markdown files and structuring them a certain way, you can actually go straight from markdown uh, into Elms LN, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so pro we've showed that workflow in some other videos, but for right now, I'm just gonna do a uh, unit-based instructional outline. Most of the time we build these out and then we end up deleting all this stuff anyway. <laughs> so after I click through that, I get taken to this page where I kind of have to wait a few minutes and wait for my network to build. And so we'll see, we've got uh, this little component that popped up here and said, hey, message center, you know, just so you're aware these things are building, you can send that away. And so Elms is going to pick up and build um, these two new applications. So uh, this is kind of a design principle of Elms is that the the courses are their own little entities and the things within courses are their own little entities. And why that's important is that, you know, day one, that probably doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, you go, why did I just wait like three, four minutes for this stuff to build? So, you know, what is build, quote unquote. Um, but later on, when you want to experiment, when you want to try new things, and when you, when we need to upgrade stuff, um, we kind of have that. So we've got this, you know, it's basically generated a play space for everybody to operate within. So just kind of flash there, um, see it says installing studio now. And so our little Elms loader snowflake thing uh, has uh, changed to orange. And so it's gonna go through, it's got a couple steps to completion. Um, so let's, while that's happening in the background, <clears throat> let's go to a course that's been built. So in this case, I'll go back to courses and I see I have Sing 100. Uh, you see I have some, some options there with like offerings. Uh, this is the way that we would actually kind of split things out into, you know, future semesters, if you will. So um, we've got, the, this has been running for about five semesters now, or sorry, five, five years <laughs> worth of semesters at uh, Arts and Architecture where I'm based out of. Um, and so we've got these lists and it's kind of allows us to hook into university logistics, um, you know, make sure there's students for a given semester. Uh, we could upload a roster of students in CSV format, or there's some more sophisticated backend types of things where you can um, wire up data from like uh, the Canvas LMS API or write your own integration, you know, if you're a third party uh, to get students in from an SIS system. Uh, so I've already set up this little course space. And the, the first thing I see when I set up a course space um, is effectively I get these links. And so these links are unique to the network that we're creating. So I'm gonna to go to content and the, the course outline in this case. And so we go to course outline. Um, it's part of the design paradigm of Elms is that the things below the fold here is what I'm really working with. Now the domain has changed. You may have noticed it went from online to courses. Um, and so you know, just to illustrate that, if I go to blogs, which as I said, is not fully fleshed out, uh, I can jump to blogs. I could jump over to the, uh, the discussion forum tool. I could jump to, see, these aren't you know, fully fleshed out, but this is the idea is that everything below the fold would then be your discussion forum tool in this case. Uh, but if I jump to studio, we get more of a actual application down there. Hey, there we go. Uh, so that this is a, a fundamental design, you know, philosophy of design of information technology here that we've taken is that these are actually uh, different systems at different locations, different websites. Um, why does that matter? Well, by following that principle, what is the functionality our system has? It, you know, it, it's ever expanding. It can continue to grow in scope because if we're funneling users into, uh, for example, content, and we've got developers and teams working on content and making sure that content is presented in a way that is you know, visually appealing and accessible and all that, that's great but simultaneously we can be working on the new studio application. And then when studio reaches maturity, we can shift efforts and work on blogs and the, it's the same overall application. Uh, so then we push our code out and then you download Elms or you upgrade Elms 
you know, a year from now, and you've got all this new functionality that we were able to work in a semi-production environment with learners and faculty, you know, kind of boots on the ground, if you will, to, to just sit there and build this new thing. Um, it also allows us to build things faster because we've already got the data model baked in. So when we build out a new application, we already have connotations of things like sections and users and user accounts and usability patterns, right? So we have this uniform UX pattern, kind of a Google-ish, you know, like, hey, where am I? Who am I? Um, but we're able to build it into kind of this compartmentalized way so that it's not affecting uh, negatively or positively for that matter, uh, you know, our content system or our studio system. So it lets us drive forward uh, faster with more accuracy and remain nimble. Uh, these also aren't the only systems that are in here. Uh, so not all of these are fully fleshed out, but there are other applications. And these are kind of rear facing applications for you as the person managing, you know, your course infrastructure. Uh, so we've got a media asset management system. We've got another asset for kind of interactive assets. This would be where you like upload zip files that unpack and maybe has like SCORM player stuff in it. Um, or you build a timeline actually in the system uh, as opposed to, you know, generating one in a flash application or something. Uh, the system I started in with online, that's actually called the course information system. It kind of helps set up and manage everything, bridge communications. Um, assessment is Got some early work into uh, quizzing and testing and grade and you know grade book types of capabilities. Compliance is for managing compliance across your portfolio. So day one, you probably don't really care a lot about you know compliance in most spaces. You're just making a course. Um, but several years later, you know you're going to have links that potentially break. You're going to have inaccessible content potentially produced, uh, copyright that needs to be managed, and so compliance is there to kind of help centralize that whole process so that as activity is happening in places it's relevant that it's going to send data to compliance it's the idea uh, we also have an, a, a central account registry um, so this is just to ensure that when you log in once you're logged into all these other uh, systems in the network and uh, live question is an experiment and inbox at this point is an experiment that's part of why they're marked experimental over here so let's go to uh, content in this case, because we said we start there. So the first thing you get with content is um, I get, you know, just kind of this outline of random pages, right? We can see, you know, as I scroll down the page, I get the little progress bar across the top. Uh, I can click to any of these. This is kind of your high level, like, you know, if you've authored a book, basically. Um, navigationally, I have the outline that I can jump back and see any point in here. Uh, I also have kind of this breadcrumb trail that lets me jump back and forth. So let's say later on in the course I'm searching like, oh, where is that? Oh, it's not in lesson nine. I meant to go to lesson eight. I could quickly jump to that without, you know, bloating the entire interface with all this stuff at once. I can also jump down into an individual page from there. We'll see that I also could have clicked on the UI here to accomplish that. I could jump between these pages. Um, you'll notice that it also uh, has generated this heading structure. Uh, so that happens automatically. And these headings are generated off of the page. So if I click that, it'll jump down and it's, it's built that dynamically based on the uh, heading structure in the page if you're familiar with HTML headings. Um, so you can see, you know, then, you know, basic you know, previous next page. Um, off to the the right hand side here, see so I have you know pencils so I can edit this material. I have ways of sharing this material elsewhere. Um, I have my preferences, which we can get into, you know, some alternative formats like printing, um, you know, PDFing the page, speed reader, which lets you run through um, an alternate you know, way of engaging the material. You also have some cool simulations uh, to simulate different accessibility um, types of conditions. Uh, you know, just kind of to get to increase some empathy and be mindful of the fact that you should be taking this into account. Um, the most useful ones I'd say are probably the colorblindness ones because you can actually simulate uh, different uh, facets of colorblindness in real time. Um, so you know, even just to do a quick spot check is some content to make sure it's accessible, it's cool. Um, there's some keyboard shortcuts. There's also some voice command stuff that there's other videos for and some minor interface modifications uh, such as color inversion and contrast modes and things. So I'm going to edit this page and we hit edit. See, I get a WYSIWYG editor. I have some additional options off to the side 
uh, that have to do with uh, instructional significance. We'll actually change, you know, play some icons to match uh, on the UI. Uh, the interface, I can manipulate the, uh, the topic banner, so I can upload a banner that will then show up here. Um, and then I also have the ability to modify colors within this, uh, so that if I wanted all my headings to take on the primary color, they would, things like that. Uh, so you could kind of do some minor, you know, bulk, uh, uh, bulk styling of your material uh, within a certain section of the course, you know, lesson, unit, what have you. Um, there's also some things associated with like, you know, hiding this material. So if the course is running and I want to hide this or this page needs some work, I can hide it and then students won't see it, but I'll still be able to get to it in the UI, things like that. And then there's advanced for advanced types of operations. We don't use those too often. Uh, so there's the title of this page, new title, nothing crazy there. Uh, I'm going to click and actually just delete all of this material and stuff here. And we're going to showcase the fact that it does its headings thing it does. So uh, heading one, heading two, and some content for good measure. All right, so write some silly content, copy and paste it a few times. Now we're going to take heading one and we're going to do, uh, clicking this word normal, we're going to change it and make it a heading. Now see that it actually picked this up as well. So let's add down there. And we'll change that to normal as well. Okay, take this heading and we're gonna make that heading two. Okay, so let's save. And now page updated, see my little message center. Hey, page title has been updated, I can dismiss that. And then you'll see it's uh, updated my title to reflect it here, and then it's also created these headings that I can now jump to. So if you imagine this page is really, really long, uh, you've got this he heading structure that follows you down the page, so you can, you know, kind of follow along, uh, know what's going on. So this, what I just did, I added a page, right? But it's kind of assuming that you already have a whole bunch of content. Um, so let's say I have, I don't have a whole bunch of content. Well, in this case, I can click the dot dots for additional operations, uh, one of which is checking accessibility. So I can fire an accessibility check, which puts a notification on these headings because headings need to be in the right order. And so then I could click and get some additional info about this, you know, make sure this isn't just used for formatting purposes. Pretty, you know, good idea. Um, but it's not going to actually correct accessibility issues. I should point that out. It's mostly just kind of inform. Um, so Let's say that I want to actually work on lesson eight. Uh, so we can go to, let's say we were on lesson eight in this case, and we're like, oh, I gotta, I gotta you know, move these pages around. I don't like the order they're in. So I can open this up and I can say edit child outline. And if I do edit child outline, it's gonna give me um, this. And so these are those pages right there. Now, if I needed to move these around, I could click one and drag it up and it's saved. So now if we just do a simple refresh, we'll see that the navigation order has changed over on this side. Now again, this assumes you have a structure in place, you're working against it. Um, if I wanted to add something under maybe page two, goes into greater detail, we don't call it page two, I could double click it. Um, and so maybe this be um, like a history of, geez, if I could spell history, that would be awesome, right? So update the title. Hey, that was renamed. Thank you. And we're going to click this and I can do add content because I want to add things under the history of cheese, right? It has starting in 1990, right? So it's not really a long history of cheese. Um, and then we could add another piece of content to there. Another thing happened in cheese add that, right? So you get the idea. And then I could take these and move them around. This is how we basically generate all, uh, all the content and the outlining uh, that we do in Elm. Some people call it the outline designer. It's, you know, your content design outline, if you will. Uh, so I can now, in the navigation, let's just jump to introduction. And we'll see that it's created now this little arrow to indicate, hey, there's stuff below history of cheese. And I can click history of cheese. And you see it's created this top level book, uh, breadcrumbing system, but also the drill down of, hey, let's see what this is about. And so we can drill down into it and author our content from there. Uh, let's say we need to make more pervasive changes though, right? That assumed there was already something in place. 
If we do edit course outline, you can modify the entire thing. This takes you to another interface, uh, you know, slightly different interface styling with just a home button because this could get a little bloated on the UI. Uh, so, you know, if I needed to take lesson two and move it above lesson one for some reason, I can do that. If I needed to add a page to the high level of the outline, I could do that. You know, if I needed to pick up and move a page from lesson one to lesson two underneath the introduction, right? So it's for these much larger operations. Um, that you know you probably do this initially when you get going. Uh, there's also some helpful little utilities like closing all the outlines or opening all the outlines, uh, as well as the operations in place there where you can hide this material in bulk or modify the title so it's rendered differently. Uh, some more advanced options. You can also duplicate things, which is very useful. So let's say I make a really good prototype of a lesson or unit. I can hit duplicate and then copy content, and it will take a copy of that, but also the entire structure beneath it. So that just duplicated like eight pages. Uh, so if I kind of did some proto, you know, rapid prototyping with this, I could stamp out a lot of content very quickly and give someone a really good impression of what it is this course would, would function like, like what would students experience uh, after making kind of a prototype lesson. It's a lot of, a lot of the way we operate with the, the, uh, the tool. So go back to home here. Um, we also have kind of some predefined uh, templated areas and we're actually working on adding a lot more of these, but uh, to get to that, it's in the little editor here and I can hit the templates button. And you'll see we've got a whole bunch of, you know, things like topic readings, uh, paper, paper stacks, uh, things like that. So won't go through all of them, but this is kind of a predefined HTML area that we can then dump in. So if I need a aligned heading of some kind, it'd be nice if I actually put one in there. There we go, topic reading. That's a much more visual one. So topic reading I can dump in, and now I've got this nice little um, CSS defined list of what things are required for someone to do and uh, what things are optional. And then once we save it, um, you can see there's some nice little CSS applied. It does this crossfade between colors on there. Um, it also you know, has a hover, a state, so you can see it. Um, so some nice little page templating things. Again, using that, you know, planning out how you would want to lay out that first lesson and then putting that into the outline, stamping that outline a lot uh, could really save you a lot of time and help, help improve uh, consistency. Um, while still giving you flexibility to break out of that mold if you want to, because we don't want to just say this is a module or this is a lesson the way traditional LMSs do. Uh, so let's move out of there. Uh, let's move on to uh, the Open Studio, which is a brand new, uh, fully functioning uh, Open Art Studio. So the Open Art Studio, uh, the goal of an Open Studio is basically to let people kind of post up their work and get feedback in a, a public manner. And so in the real world, this happens kind of in the hallway. I put my, my poster up of the work that I've been doing or the photographs I shot. Um, and then other students come around with the instructor and we all give you feedback, uh, critique you, things like that. So the point of this platform is almost to create sort of this like closed uh, Pinterest type of a thing where your friends can comment on, and so a lot of friends or classmates can comment on uh, what you're doing and you can get feedback from them and the instructor and kind of learn through doing. So the first thing you get when you come to the Open Studio is uh, we see we have, you know, students obviously don't see administration, but we have uh, recent activity, project management, and then view studio projects. And so recent activity is going to give you this, this updating kind of heads up display of who needs feedback, um, what things have been submitted recently, and uh, any you know comments in the studio that are not your own. Um, now, this is much more impressive when students are using it. Uh, obviously, for legal reasons, I can't show you students using it, but we have a little over 100 students across uh, three courses uh, in, and four, four different sections in three courses uh, using this currently, and it's very, very impressive the amount of discussion that's going on. Very excited. Um, so the first thing I'll see though is, hey, these are your active projects. So if you imagine this is kind of the assignments, this is gonna show you the last project I worked on. 
And so I could either go to project management or I could click on just this in general and it'll take me to project management. And so I have some additional options because I can build stuff obviously. Uh, but so let's say I wanted to add a new project. I could hit create new project. And then it's kind of this Kanban board that's being built. So if you imagine that you know, you're know you setting up the tasks uh, and these projects for the students to do by gr grouping them in projects. I mean, you could just have one project if you really wanted and then putting the assignments in the projects just so that you know maybe this would be unit one, unit two, unit three, unit four. Um, it could be whatever you want. Um, so then these assignments, as I've added them here, uh, if I want to add another assignment, maybe say to our new project, hit add assignment. And I get these placeholder, hey, this is a new assignment. Now, if someone were to click new assignment, they get a little pop-up and there's nothing in here. It just says new assignment. Uh, so I'm going to first edit the project. And so I'd hit edit there. And project one. And this is about cheese. I really into cheese today. Uh, we can throw in some due date information, whether or not to allow late submissions, uh, some color and image you know, visualization for it that we haven't uh, fully implemented, and then whether or not it depends on other projects. These are all kind of bridge UX, um, if you will. So this form is currently something we're replacing um, with, with a, a Polymer app, uh, which as you'll see, the student experience is much smoother. Uh, so I'm gonna hit save. And it's going to take me back to the board. It's going to reload. And then off on the side, I hit project one. And so that's kind of the, the UX pattern. The same is, is the same for the assignment as far as, you know, you have some additional options. Uh, but we're currently revamping those into a single page. Uh, so what, would, what it would look like if I started by assignment, right? So imagine these students have all this work. And they say, all right, let's go to do assignment. And they're going to read the directions that would be posted here. And they say, hey, I haven't started this, right? Submission not started, so this is locked. And go, hey, create it. So I'm going to create a submission. This takes me to the submission to work on. You see it populates initially with submission four and then whatever the name of that assignment is. Um, but I can call this anything. All right, so this is my new project. I'm going to write some submission text here. And this is a little markdown editor uh, that's been placed in split view if I want to full on right, I can, or I can just preview what it would say, or split view. You don't have to put anything in here, but you know, maybe it's a document you need to write ahead of time. Uh, this accepts markdown, so I could bold that. Um, I could make a, you know, bulleted listing of things. It has all the affordances of, uh, of markdown. Um, and if you've used GitHub's markdown thing, it is fairly intuitive. Um, we haven't had a, uh, you know, writing is kind of a secondary uh, thing. Like you're kind of more so just describing your work that's more visual in nature. And so we haven't had a ton of, you know, need to do UX testing on this specific piece yet. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a, a weak markdown editor. If I wanted to throw in a link to YouTube or something, I can do that there. And now it's you know giving me the preview of whatever that links off to. Um, if I wanted to upload images, then I would click on the uh, the images button here, right? Because I haven't submitted anything. And I see I have this little uploaded files thing, and I'm going to click that. It's going to take me to my hard drive. Uh, I'm going to find some pictures, right? And I can do a multi-select in this case. I could drag and drop them as well. I just don't have any pictures immediately available on my desktop. I'll hit open and then it's going to take each of those and it's going to upload those files and then they appear when they're ready to go. Um, I also, if I, you know, if it was a more written, uh, you know, laid out assignment, if you will, I could click this embed button and it would tell me, hey, copy and paste this to get your image to show up. So if there was some reason I needed to place this image into uh, my text above, I could do that. Uh, we want students to quantify them separately. That's kind of more of an edge case. The primary use case for this, you know, the media creation is, a, you know, giving review and feedback on each other's stuff. Um, if it wasn't images, let's say it was files, I could upload a PDF um, or a Word doc. Uh, links is kind of the same as above. I could just throw in a link here. So throw in that random YouTube link. Uh, we also, right, so this is just a link. So 
uh, what this will do. You know, let's let's save draft and then we'll get to this video one. So uh, we have three options here. We have publish to studio, we have save draft, and we have delete. Uh, so a lot of times when you're producing work um, that's highly visual in nature, you, you're going to iterate over it. Maybe I just wrote the text or maybe I just found this one link and I want to get started on it, but I don't want to do the entire thing and then lose it. Um, so I'm going to put it into a draft state. And so after I put it in a draft state, it's going to reload. It's going to show me a preview of what it is, but it's not done yet. Uh, it's not available for other people to see. Um, but let's say I go, oh, you know what? I put that in the wrong place. I wanted to actually show the YouTube video in context here. That would be nice. So I can go back up. I can see the assignment details real quick and be like, oh, shoot, it did say the link to two to YouTube videos. Um, so I'm going to hit edit, bring back to edit state. I'm going to go down. I can you know review those pictures again. Maybe I say, oh, I didn't mean to upload that one. Uh, links, I didn't mean to put that here. And then videos, if I paste that YouTube link in here, it's going to detect the right way to embed it automatically. Uh, so paste that in. Hey, I got my two videos in. Now uh, I'm ready to go. Let's, you know, we can publish this to the studio. Uh, so I'm going to hit publish. Say, hey, by publishing, the author of the submission will be able to view your feedback. Are you ready to publish? There we go. So I published my work. And then what publishing my work does is you'll notice now the left column has the ability to comment. So people can give me feedback. Now, they couldn't give me feedback and they wouldn't see my work while it's in a draft phase because uh, I'm still working on it to try and get something out to, that's worth reviewing. Uh, you also notice at a glance, I can say, hey, there's no comments on this. Uh, so now after working on that, let's go back to recent activity real quick at the dashboard. You see recent studio submissions now has that other, that other posting show up, right? That was that, but uh, this is all I call anything. And it's also marked on my active board as to the fact that I finished this assignment. So let's jump over to that and I can see, hey, it's published there, awesome. Uh, I could also see, hey, this one's got a warning notice with it. And so this, you know, if you imagine as the students are going through and they're starting assignments or finishing them, uh, I might go, oh, you know what, shoot, he did say that I forgot that. Um, I forgot to publish this. So I can hit that and now it's available for viewing. Uh, so this allows for bulk management as well. If, you know, say you're working through multiple submissions, but they're not ready to go out the door. Maybe you're having an offline conversation with someone about what the requirements really are. You don't want to get feedback on it just yet. And then I can go through and bulk add, you know, bulk enable these, bulk submit them, things like that. Uh, so let's view studio projects then, because that's kind of where all the interactivity happens. What I just showed was kind of more of the in the vacuum. Hey, let's just, I'm doing my submission. So we've got four, four basic panes here. So we've got uh, submission display, we've got a project board, uh, something that's assignment centric and table view. And so the initial is, hey, here's just everything. This is everything everyone has done uh, that they've published for a review by other people. It gives whatever the last image submitted as the preview, um, just so it's to get a glance at the work, right? So from there I could say, oh, well, let's check that one out click and it jumps up and then I might be reviewing someone else's work. I pop open and view their media in greater detail. And then I'm like, oh, you know what? I do want to leave them feedback. Now in this case, it's going to give me a badge because I'm the ad, um, I'm a staff member. And so there's a little uh, staff member badge and there's a little like uh, uh, education hat, um, graduation cap. Uh, for the teacher. And so that that way, the comments from instructors, it's not that they still show up in the same place. It's just that they're offset a little bit visually, um, as well as accessibility. There's a screen reader message to indicate that it's the instructor speaking, um, just in case people want to, you know, know what feedback the, the instructor gave versus all their classmates. Uh, so I can type here and leave a comment. <coughs> Same simple markdown editor from before. Save. Uh, it does this ellipsis. So, you know, if you have a lot of text, I can kind of jump between these, expanding to review the entire thing. That way, if someone writes a lot uh, and I'm going to say, oh, wow, 10 people coming on myself, that's awesome. Uh, or if I really want to dig into detail, I can open that up. Uh, you can also reply to other people. So then this is relative to that submission or reply. Um, now, if I go back to studio projects, right, so I might find another classmate, uh, 
to comment on. I might have a specific classmate that I'm looking for. So I might pop open author, and in this case you see it's just me. Um, I might have a specific project. So project one submissions, right? None of these are in project one. They were in, uh, there's my submission in new project, and there's my other three submissions in that project, right? So it, it's filtering in real time. Um, we can, you know, if we could find the assignment among the thousand words, there we go. There's the assignments that are available. Uh, so I can then uh, go to different ways of slicing this information, right? So this is great to have a heads up display. Uh, but let's say if I'm the instructor, I might actually want kind of a table view, or I might, you know, just as another classman, I might be curious. So let's take off the filtering, and you see that we have uh, the name of the project that these are that these are for. I have the uh, title of the submission. Hey, this submission. A, but I can call this anything I want. And then it gives me some overview stats. So I could click these columns and sort things by comments. You sort it by images submitted, videos, um, author, the date it was submitted. I can expand these columns so I can read more or less of what it is that I need to. Uh, at the bottom, I can also do some more advanced filtering um, where it will match against the words that show up. Like if I know that this was submitted in August, I'd be like, oh, well, no one made submissions in August. Um, or if I only want things that have zero comments, like let's say the instructor said, hey, uh, can you go comment on five people's work that doesn't have any comments on it currently? This allows me to quickly jump in and see what doesn't have comments on it um, to, to satisfy that. So let's take, a, take away our filtering here and let's go uh, to uh, let's click this button. So what this button's going to do is it's going to take me over to project board. And so if I do new project, see it selects project board and then also selected me as the author and then this new project I've been working on. So this is kind of a public display of my status on this project uh, so that anybody can come in and see this and they see, hey, in new project, there's five assignments, but this person's only done this one. So this is the only part of that project. And then it's going to take those submissions against this project for those assignments, and it's going to put them all here. So if I go to, I know it's the last one, right? I can see that I have submitted work against three of these things. And then as we scroll down, it's I can get this composite view of my project ordered by the assignments in the order at which they're in the project. Uh, so as I go through, I can kind of review this person's work as a whole. Uh, so it becomes greater, you know, to be able to review the entire body of work than just the individual thing, uh, which could you could play into that with the way the assignment is submitted. Uh, some people are using this uh, like a progression. So the first submission is draft work, and then the second submission is a little bit more refined, and then the third is after taking into account feedback, and then the fourth might be the final. So that you as a faculty member coming through to assess, you can visually step down through their progression know what the feedback was at any given time, um, and then you know grade accordingly. Um, another view is assignment-centric, and assignment-centric won't be nearly as useful as that at the moment. But you can see, hey, uh, select an assignment in order to view this, duh. So I'm gonna do new assignment. And what new assignment does, or assignment-centric, is it's gonna take an assignment and then based on the criteria, only show submissions that are that, but it's gonna show the full submission. Uh, so submission display is kind of that overview, right? But if I did assignment centric, I would actually get everyone's uh, submission for that assignment. And so this would start to list across all the students uh, and then it provides a nice little anchor linkage so I can jump down and see just that student's work. I could quickly shortcut to comment on their work to you know go off and focus on just theirs. Uh, so this is, you know, when you have a larger class, uh, and you know your faculty is also a great way to just at a glance see what everybody's up to uh, so you can see the submissions that everyone's made uh, for this assignment uh, so it's it's pretty been pretty cool to see the way uh, this is this has been out in production for about uh, two weeks as of uh, recording this video. So it's been really cool to see the amount of media that students are, are putting in, the amount of engagement that's going on relative to past versions of the studio because we didn't even really show past versions of the studio, um, as well as the, the future directions of this. Um, and, and, you know, being uh, we're going to get into critiquing with formalized critiquing with it, um, 
you know, better uh, UX transitions between certain operations, uh, better notifications as far as when someone has commented on your things, um, stuff like that. So another system, jump off to another place, uh, would be uh, media, the media system. So our media system has been built out for quite a while. So media has a few ways of inter interacting with it. Um, so this is kind of more of a rear facing system, if you will. So um, that there's all these different types of media that I can put in here. So this would be how I, I store and quantify video, SVG, um, a gallery of images. Um, maybe I'm doing some H5P interactive content. I'll go do one of those. Uh, or maybe I'm putting in a YouTube video, but I'm not a student. I'm, I'm a staff member uh, or a faculty member. We're building a course. So we need to be able to you know, embed this video. How do we get it and quantify it and know uh, you know, because a lot of times if you're using like a YouTube or a Vimeo, videos get takedown notices or they get taken off the internet. So it's good to quantify them in a system that isn't just that source so that you don't, you know, have your iframes break all over the place or what have you. Uh, so said we're going to do H5P. So let's do an H5P. And H5P is a highly interactive um, element. And so it's a pretty awesome aspect of system. I'm not going to go through all the details of the media system, but this is kind of this system of systems, if you will. So an H5P element is just a very generically like this. I want to make something highly interactive. Uh, okay. Uh, so you can see there's, you know, things like memory games, marking the words, creating a timeline, um, guessing the answer to something. Um, true false questions. There's some more experimental stuff like speak the words, which is really cool, but very experimental. Uh, you know, recording, personality quizzes, image sequencing to make sure images are in the right order. Um, and, you know, simple quizzes, fill in the blanks, drag and drop. Interactive video is very, very impressive. So let's get interactive video because I haven't installed it on here yet. You see, it gives me an example of what interactive video is. I'm gonna install this. Cool, let's use interactive video. And then it would give me a little tour. I can see the way to go about using this, adding interactions, etc. cetera. Um, so I can either paste a YouTube link or I can upload a video in here. Uh, we're gonna paste that YouTube link from before. And then this lets me, you know, mess with different field things like, you know, editing copyrights, um, all right, as well as either pointing to a subtitle track, like I can upload a subtitle track, or I can use the YouTube generated one, so good, good for accessibility. Um, and it says, hey, next step is to add interactions. So we've got a video up, we need to do something with it. So let's add interactions, which moves us along here. And you see it's got kind of this little browser of its own uh, to build stuff. And so, it, again, teaching us about the UI a little bit. So let's close that away. Um, so let's say I have a video, and in this video, in this case, I'm showing that uh, the Canvas LMS does not accept custom HTML elements, um, which if it did, it would be really a lot more useful. Uh, however, let's say that some point in this video, like, you know, it'd be really great to stop and ask them a question. Uh, so I can put down a single choice question. I can say, hey, pause the video. Um, I need this to be on the screen uh, from four seconds to 10 seconds. Uh, let's do a poster style instead of a little button to indicate, hey, this, you know, this is the question to do. And the question we're going to ask is, um, is Canvas better than uh, Notepad? Um, and then the alternatives are, absolutely, why wouldn't it be? And then another alternative might be, of course, Notepad is better. It costs way less. And it is just as instructionally significant to learners. Um, and so I could add other questions in there, but I'm just going to add that one, right? Uh, then I can have overall feedback, right? You can get pretty sophisticated uh, with, with things in here. You can get into adapt adaptivity to jump back at other points in the video, stuff like that. Um, so in this case, we're just going to put that question down. I'm going to hit done. Yep, it wants me to add another question. There we go. I'm gonna hit done. And now I have my little poster here. I can kind of position it on the screen. We wanna 
hit people in the face with this <laughs> so that they know that they have to engage in this question. Um, and then, you know, I could do this at other points in time. Maybe I jump much later in this and like, hey, uh, want something different, right? I could add some little like bumper text into things. Um, uh, visual for this, background color, let's make it green. Choose, uh, let's not give it a box shadow, done. Right, so we get this glaring, hey, do you wanna do something different? Cause this isn't really that fun. Um, so I added those things into my video. Uh, we also have, because of the nature of H5P, uh, we have support for uh, what's known as accessible fallbacks. And so if you supply an accessible fallback, um, it'll actually allow users to do something different. Uh, so let's say this wasn't for testing. We actually don't recommend that you use interactive video for like hard quiz, hard testing types of things, um, just because of the accessibility constraints of needing to jog to certain points in videos to unlock operations. Um, so let's say that we had a fallback of static content in this case. And in the case of the static content, uh, would say, um, uh, no, let's say, is Canvas all that? And then maybe instead of the video in which I'm kind of poking fun at Canvas's inability to allow custom HTML attributes, because heaven forbid you actually do things on your own, what we could do is have that same blur. And then I can create this content. And now I've got an accessible fallback. So it's a good idea to provide an accessible fallback in the case, you know, if we use interactive media in this case. Uh, so we could do save and add another, or let's just save this. So after we've saved it, uh, because we supplied a more accessible form this media, you'll see there's a button right at the top of this. And so if I were to trigger this, it actually is gonna update in place and then provide that fallback material instead. Uh, and then you can switch back, but it's a, it's a neat little trick um, to, you know, let's say you had a video, but you actually have a series of images with text that show the same thing. Um, maybe someone hitting this with a screen reader is gonna hit this text and there's area text in there to say like, hey, this is a highly uh, interactive form of media. You might wanna opt for this version, you know, press this button in order to, to get this version instead. Uh, so, but if I, if I don't want the, uh, the accessible version, we can move through this. We can see the little video is doing its thing and then stop. And so it stops and asks me that question. Uh, yeah, of course, Notepad is better. Oh man, I got the answer wrong, <laughs> right? And we can see the solution, we can retry it or we can just continue and it starts the video again. Uh, so then the video is gonna jog along and then my incredibly bright, obnoxious link shows up and you can jump off to someplace else, which has then paused the video. So there's lots of really neat uh, little things this does. So we've uploaded this video and, or you know, pointed to this video. We've got this H5P asset and we've got it in another location. Now, architecturally, we've got it in another location because this H5P thing is awesome and instructional designers are going nuts for them. Uh, faculty members are really asking a lot of questions. Um, they also track XAPI data. If you're familiar with learner analytics, that's a big deal. Uh, Elms is also wired heavily with, uh, with XAPI support. Uh, so why put all that someplace else? Well, I, I, I couldn't tell you where H5P is gonna be as a project next year or in six months. And so this allows us to keep moving, to keep innovating and keep building out our other parts of our you know, suite of tools. If this would kind of fall out of favor as a community, then you move on to something else. We add, we add more capability and, and applications to this without disrupting our previous you know, uh, data flows, if you will. Uh, so let's, you know, we can look at our course list so we could see, I believe I put this in demo 100 in this case. No, I didn't, I must have put it in Sync 100. No, nope, must have put it in Sync 100's assets. Uh, so we've got our list with our assets here and filter by Sync 100. Um, maybe I didn't put it in any course, <laughs> I guess not. Uh, so we can view this asset and have all of our assets in one place as opposed to submitting them to lots of different places. Um, then we can pick the different ways to display it. Now, in the case of H5P, it honestly doesn't make a ton of sense to use anything other than like 
H5P or H5P card. Uh, H5P card is a nice little, it offsets it visually and centers it. So let's do H5P card. And so I'm gonna hover over this and have copy content. And then what this has done, I'm gonna paste it up top here real quick so you can see, is it's copied this special token uh, that's, that's unique to Elms. And this, this token is when Elms renders that token, it's gonna convert it into the thing that we see here. Uh, so this creates a reference to, um, not to the media directly, but to the intention of the media, uh, which is an important distinction. So later on, we're gonna be able to swap out this video and this interaction or the accessible content. And no matter where this has been used, it's gonna update successfully. Uh, we can also present this outside of Elms, uh, which is another reason to have these things in different places. So if I click the, this little embed this content icon, uh, I get some other methods that are not in that list. And so these are less common than what you see presented there, right? So I have, you know, just give a link to it or do a modal pop up or side, you know, a side fly out navigation. Uh, but I also have iframe and I have direct link which then would allow someone to provide a link off to this or just see this thing, see, in this case. So this kind of allows Elms to break outside these traditional uh, barriers of LMSs where I would have never been able to give you access to this media because I would have uploaded it into a course that is only available in one location because of my university sign-on system or what have you. Uh, what this has allowed me to do is now I can use this as a standalone media system to power everything that we do and it happens to have first you know, tier support with the, the things of the institution to embed this in a course. So let's actually go and stick this back in Singularity 100. Um, so I'm going to go to my course list, Sing 100, and I'm going to select the course outline. And then I'll go to one of those introduction pages I was messing with. Um, the poking fun at um, at custom HTML elements. Um, you'll see in a minute as to why we would do that. So uh, what we have here is a custom HTML element and this custom HTML element is not unique to Elms. You can use this in any system that allows you to, to do the import. If you have any questions about that, it's, a, it's actually a separate project uh, that's related to Elms called uh, LRN Components. And LRN Components are a series of custom HTML tags for education to express pedagogy. And so let's say in this case, you wanted to put a table on a page instead of writing a table and doing uh, inaccessible HTML or design work and not even intentionally, like, I mean, I screwed that stuff up too. Um, this is gonna interpret what I'm putting in and pointing to a CSV file and convert it to a, an HTML table on a fly. So I'm gonna, we're gonna do two things at once here. So we're going to uh, paste in our little short code. And so you see, we have our short code there that I took from the other system to give me this H5P. And so what we're gonna do now is I'm just gonna save. So I've put this little token in here. We're gonna save and see what happens. So first, in the case of the LRN table, you saw a real quick little loading spinner, and then it takes whatever that CSV file said and it creates a highly accessible, well-designed table. And so this is just all this fake student uh, you know, date, score data from this other location, but also gives me a, a quick link. So if I wanted to download that table, I can. Um, mind you, I, I wrote a single HTML tag that unpacked and did all of this, and it's pointing to another file. So now it's a lot easier to manage a CSV file, whether that file lives on a server or it's uploaded, you know, into the media system as a document, um, or to, you know, you edit that file, add new records to it, and have it propagate and update other places. Uh, with guarantees of accessibility, which is a big deal. But let's scroll to the second cool interactive thing we added here, and it's that H5P element. So now that token is unpacked and we've got our H5P asset right here. Uh, if I want to enable access, more accessible form media, hit that, and now I've got my little you know, modal thing in place with the accessible media. Uh, I can take my interaction, scroll through, hit my question, All right? Gives me my little audio confirmation that I did it. Yay, gold star, continue and jump along, right? This is by reference though. So now if I edit that file in any way, it's everywhere that's used is gonna be good to go. Um, another, and this is a, a minor UX convention we have at the moment, is if this is from somewhere else and I'm like an instructor or faculty member um, or staff, 
I can click this and I can see what the additional display options are or I can jump to edit. And so this is kind of, we're starting to stitch together the UX patterns of the different systems and how you get between places. Um, and so now I could just edit this material. Um, let's say that instead of changing the title, I actually changed um, the fallback. And so, well, the course that that was, that should be in a course, you know, maybe I, I screwed that up before. I didn't actually quantify it in a course I thought I did. So we'll say it's in SYNC 100. Now that we're here, is Canvas all that? The title doesn't even show. Um, so we'll give you the short answer, uh, no. And so let's update that content. So I've updated the accessible fallback. And then I noticed, you know, that the answer in that video was wrong. And so I'm gonna scroll to this. Uh, double click that and is canvas better than notepad and that the answer uh, first answer is always the correct one so move that up of course notepad is better now it's going to present these random uh, for for students downstream it's not like they know the first one is always correct uh, but this just tells h5p what the correct answer is so we've got that in place and now we're going to save and there we go that's been updated and so now my interactive media says no afterwards, uh, but I didn't update the actual content. I just updated the underlying piece and this now uh, has the correct answer, which is that notepad is fantastic uh, for pedagogy. Uh, and then we can continue on there. So you can see uh, a lot of work has been done. Uh, if you've seen past screencasts of, of Elms, uh, a lot of work has been done on UX patterns um, on, you know, just, design conventions, uh, we're, we're aligning more and more with uh, the material design specification by Google. Uh, we've also got uh, some very deep integration with, uh, with other platforms like uh, Canvas. Um, you know, we've, we're starting to flush out the design of you know, what your profile is, starting to be able to do uh, major architectural feats like uh, spoofing an account across a whole bunch of different domains in a secure manner. Um, and so the kind of the promise of the, the platform is really starting to come to fruition. Um, we're working on, you know, usability. I, I realize I jump between domains like it's nothing. I mean, I've been working on this for four years now, uh, but we're improving the UX uh, between systems and even removing, you know, changing our language, removing connotations of things like systems, changing them to apps and more apps. Um, you know, if I go into uh, courses here, there's that demo 100 that we were starting on at the beginning. Um, and if I hit demo 100, we'll see that as we were talking, our services are set up available in the background. Um, and I can now jump to this unique network, which doesn't have those other uh, systems in place. I've got a fresh studio that I can start working on and populating with projects for a new batch of learners. Um, and so really starting to get this kind of buttery, very snappy, uh, user experience pattern that we've been looking for for quite a while um, so that you know drag and drop things just work you notice that little fade away thing that gave me a badge to say hey you did a great job uh, thanks for submitting that you know being able to publish things very quickly uh, being able to comment you know with, without a lot of effort involved and things are you know becoming much more logical in the way that they're presented um, much better Visual UX, oh, it's a huge image, that's a problem there. <laughs> I was wondering what was going on with that. Um, huge, huge picture of a boat there. Um, you know, student experience, being able to get beyond just content, uh, being able to get into engaging interactive media. Um, and so this has only touched on probably half of the functionality of, of the platform. Um, if you have more interest in this or wanna you know, learn more about what the team is up to, elmsln.org or um, elmsln on Twitter. Um, there's also a video channel uh, on, on YouTube uh, where we post any video that has to do with the project um, or join us in our issue queues. Uh, we're a very active community. So thank you for checking in and we hope to see you at the future of EdTech.